Now, as the world reels from the Brexit vote, where Britain voted to leave the EU, many say the result was largely driven by concerns over immigration, not to mention Europe's ongoing refugee crisis. However, while some may be pulling up the drawbridge, others are seeking solutions to offer help to the hundreds of thousands of people seeking a new life here on the continent. Josephine Gu works for Techfugees, a not-for-profit organisation set up by the international tech community to meet their needs. She was also listed, by the way, in the 30 Under 30 for Social Entrepreneurship by Forbes magazine, and she joins me in the studio today. Josephine, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much. First of all, tell us a little bit more about Techfugees and how that came about. So Techfugees was started last September 2015 when um, the public opinion in Europe woke up to the photo of the baby island. And the tech community, especially in London, um, led by Mike Butcher, felt we need to discuss of how we can help because we felt we could do something with technology. I've worked for the last four years in immigration and technology, and I've seen how technology can really help people access information. Oh, so. Just give me some examples of exactly where it does help, particularly people who seem to have nothing but their smartphones in many cases. Yeah. I mean, it can help greatly get information or get in touch with their peers so that they get the right information to just go across Europe. But I think what we're trying to really do with TechFugees is answer their needs. They have five needs. One is um, having access to information in Wi-Fi. Second, education, the job market, so that they can get their dignity back and just integrate. Um, healthcare, as well as social inclusion. And social inclusion can be very broad. So in the scope of those five needs that we think refugees have to have sorted and helped very, very, like, quickly, um, we've developed a network of hackathons, events, conferences, where hackers, um, tech entrepreneurs, as well as refugees, NGOs, would convene, talk, and discuss what can we do with those smartphones, create an app, create um, a sort of chatbot. Is it using WhatsApp API to just get the information for the refugees to be safe on the road? So. A lot of ideas came out of the hackathons, and now we're just filtering those um, those apps, those projects through Base Fugees, a platform we've created online. Now, when you talk about using hackers, I mean, there's a very negative image about yeah. hackathons as such, right. and it, it's it's somewhat sort of disconcerting when you actually hear you say we were using hackers for good. It's a real good question. We actually make sure that. Everyone who comes to our event, talk to refugees and talk to NGOs to understand really what is the challenge of the refugee and also what does the refugee need and not go wild and test out something that could make people die at sea, right? So we have a user-centered design approach as well as we care about privacy of data and security of data. And this is not just even a principle. It's a process that we're trying to teach at those events. So hacking, we hack in small groups just, and we don't deploy it until it's validated by the NGOs. But Josephine, the tech community is not really regarded as being generously spirited or community-minded. So how difficult was it to actually get people on board? It's actually grown very big, very fast. We have now 27 chapters after 10 months since last September. We've grown so big very, very fast because I think there's a, there's a civic tech community that is appearing in Europe that wants to answer the crisis that we're faced right, with right now, as well as there is, I think, a bit of um, a boredom out of some software engineers working for tech companies and not seeing exactly where they're making an impact. There's a lot of comments on like the Generation Y and millennials uh, wanting to have an impact and wanting to have meaning in what they do. And I think... So they're not interested in just making billions and billions of euros? I think that's a bit of a prejudice that might be true in some part of the US. And I think in Europe, definitely, we're seeing another trend taking over. The other thing that you're doing, of course, is also offering education, particularly coding classes for refugees. I'm very interested in those coding classes for women. Tell me a little bit more about it. Yeah, so um, we, do, we do help those organisations 
that create coding classes for refugees. And for example, there's one uh, that just did a hackathon back in Berlin, Ready School. It creates opportunities for refugees to learn digital skills. And part of their courses, you find women. And it's, I think, very important that we include women in that conversation because women are a big chunk of those refugees. They're more vulnerable. We know that one out of 10 have, uh, are pregnant and they're coming from sometimes traditional societies where the woman is not allowed to go out uh, in public and to work. And so we're trying to have them socially included so that they understand that you're in Europe and you can do what you want to do. And, and we know there's a shortage of software engineers, women software, software engineers. So if we can show um, the difference uh, with refugees, women saying we can code and we're we're not a burden on society, we're actually a contribution, we are a resource. And um, I think it's very inspiring for a lot of other women, refugees or not.